again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you guys. So cool. I was just complimenting Eddie on your guys' recording studio there, your little setup. (laughs) Oh my gosh. He's amazing. I always, and people always talk about the podcast um, to me and I'm always like, dude, it would not exist if it were not for him. So I wanted to do one for, for years, but he does all the audio, the producing. And yeah, this was, um, this was just our like fourth bedroom downstairs and okay. he just went to town and turned it into a studio. So, <laughs> yeah, well, he does a great dope. job with it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Where are you guys? What what side of the country are you guys on? We're in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. More the East Coast. So we're on. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. About the middle. Awesome. Of the state. We used to live in Falls Church, Virginia. Mm. Mm, nice. and, um, yeah, I remember nice. one one birthday, Eddie um, surprised me and drove me to Philadelphia so I could have a Philly cheesesteak sandwich for, for my birthday when we lived out there. Yeah, Did you do the Rocky awesome. Stairs while you're in Philly? <laughs> I, I can't even remember. No, we kind of just stayed like downtown the whole time. But I've been there a couple times. I went there as a soccer player. Um, I traveled around with like this nonprofit team and we put on soccer camps and, and we all, like everyone that was coaching, we, all the counselors, we all stayed in um, houses in the suburbs of of Pennsylvania. So I got to experience that, that side of it, but that was as a (laughs) soccer player. So yes. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you should come out and run the Appalachian trail out here. Of course they call it rocks. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I love the AT trail. So I, for like six years, I put on trail running camps, um, in North Carolina. Mm. And, um, that was one of our days was on the, on the AT trail, just Amazing. Thank you so yeah. much. Wow. <laughs> Everyone needs an Eddie. He just brought me coffee, Aww. set me up. Thank you. <laughs> Great guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, you should pay him more. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> uh, well, I think we first talked to you in December of 2021. So it's been about a year and a half. Obviously, a lot yeah. has happened in your world since then. Um, yeah. We want to congratulate you on the recent release of your book, Choose Strong, The Choice That Changes Everything. Um, that was out is it two days ago now. Yeah, it, it came like the official published date was June 4th. So I think that's when it hit all the Kindles. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a few hiccups with Amazon. So it actually went out a couple days early. I think just like two days early. So um, a couple people uh, got it like before June 4th. But yeah, like this week is, has been like the big launch. So it's been really neat to see. Oh. Um, a little bit of feedback and people posting about it, but yeah, it's finally done. (laughs) Yes. Well, I enjoyed reading it. I had the PDF version, but it was very moving, really, really powerful story. And so I'm just kind of wondering what it was like for you to write that book and put your story out there because you had a lot of trauma in your life and, Mm -hmm. you know, what was it like to be able to have to process that? And, you know, because obviously there's a lot of inner healing that has to happen before you put it out into the world. Yeah, so true. I started writing it actually. It took me, I, I think I said this like in the in the um prologue that it took me almost 20 years to write it because yeah, just as you said, there's some inner healing that needs to happen. Um, I come from a big family. So um, and as I say in the book there, like I was treated differently than my siblings. So that that part is hard. Mm, yes. There's a lot of kind of difficult situations in my childhood that I struggled to understand because, you know, on one hand, um, you know, I have, I have a dad that, you know, I, he's not, he hasn't been a part of my life for a long time, but I had to come to a season where I realized the power of, of forgiveness is, is freedom. And even if someone never says they're sorry or thinks they didn't do anything wrong, um, you can still forgive. And so I had to get to that place because it was, I had a lot of years where I tried to downplay it. Well, it wasn't that bad. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of kids get spanked. Like you want to like make everything seem less than it is. But, um, for me, I, you know, I, I kept journal since the time I was a little girl. Um, the way that I experienced trauma, unfortunately, is I have very specific things that I remember over and over again, and I will for the rest of my life. Um, and I've been with, with Eddie, we've, we've been together since we were 18. So he's, he's watched me grow up. His family's pretty much been 
my my family since the time I was 18 years old, so more than half my life. Wow. And there is a lot of things, just even our relationship, that I would have reactions to that I didn't know, you know, why I was like that. And, um, you know, and it'd be little things like being in a grocery store and, you know, hearing a parent get really mad at a kid. Like I just would have like these visceral reactions and want to like literally want to go save the kid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, You're is, like, I've got to rescue them. What's wrong with me? <laughs> yeah. Like, so, so, so many things over the years, as I was writing the book, I realized one of the things I don't want to do, and I even talk about it in the book, is like I, I I don't like this idea of like, oh, feel sorry for me. Like, I don't want to write a victim book. I don't want to write about, I don't want to put a book out into the world that's like, here's all the sad things that that happened in my life. This is why I'm bitter and angry. And then like raise a fist to all of those issues. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of that out there right now. You know, a lot of people that, you know, I I think a lot of what our world is dealing with too, it is deeply rooted in pain. There's a lot of pain and hurt. And then we turn it into, um, you know, maybe we turn it into like activism or, you know, I'm fighting for this reason, but it's like, man, like if we looked inside and see why we're so angry and bitter, um, I, I, I knew there were seasons in my life that I was like that, that I was angry and I was bitter and I was upset. And like, why did my childhood have to be like this? And why am I still dealing with these things? And, um, so I knew that from the time I really started even on social media, I want to create a place where people can be encouraged, where they can feel like, whatever it is that I'm doing, I don't think there's anything necessarily great that I'm doing, but it's like, I want people to understand they're valued, they're loved, they're capable, they're strong. And I think a lot of that stems from not feeling like that for, you know, the first 20 years of my life or warring with that. And I, I think that I had to kind of like throw the book away a couple of times because the original version of it, it was very strong and, and, and had this very angry tone. And I thought that's not the book I want to put out into the world. And so I had to work through all of that. And then I also had to work through a lot of fear, um, fear of being sued, fear of, um, of just like what people would think of the critics. Um, I suffered a lot of just kind of second guessing myself too. Like my story isn't that important or, um, these stories, um, you know, these, these aren't that bad or like, you know, or did it really happen that way? And always downplaying myself. And I realized, well, I do that a lot in my everyday life. Like I, you know, nothing is ever good enough or like, this isn't, you know, that great. Like, and I had a lot of conversations with Eddie about that, how, wow, when you grow up a certain way and you're always kind of suppressed and you're not seen and you're not valued and, and, um, kind of ignored, it's easy to go and and live your life that way because that's all that you've known. Mm -hmm. So it, it took a, it, it took, that's why it took such a long time to write it was just, you know, it was fear. It was, it was healing, but then in the last couple of years, um, you know, I was like, I need to finish this thing. And Eddie was so encouraging. He's like, you, you really just need to finish it. And, and I think that the stories that are weaved in there at the end of the day, the book is, is hard to read to a degree. Um, but I didn't want to make the whole book just about me, even though there are stories about my life. Like I wanted that even people who grew up with a great childhood to be able to look and see themselves in there and realize that they are strong and that they can overcome and that no matter how long a season of, of hardship or, or difficulty that, that you're in, that, um, you don't know how the story is going to end. You don't know what's on, you know, around the bend. And, um, and that's why some of those poems are in there, the poems that I had written over the years to really just reflect that, that glimmer of hope and, um, hopefully in, in, you know, encouragement to people. But so far the response has been incredible. Um, you know, it's, it's been an overwhelming week for me, like the weeks leading up, uh, a lot of, you know, a a little bit of stress and anxiety about like, oh my gosh, I'm about to release this story to the world for the first time because it's the, the first time in its entire entirety, um, that, that people will learn about. I think I've, I've shared little stories like here and there, especially the story about Yellow Runner. People always wonder like, where did that name come from? And, and that's detailed in the book and, um, 
you know, but I've only, I usually have only told that like in, in a, in front of like a live audience. And, um, so yeah, it was like, all right, well here, here's all of it. So (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Well, I will say having read it, that hope does come through very strongly, your resilience. And so I think you did an amazing job and I think people are going to be encouraged and uplifted by it. So thanks for putting it out there. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate you reading it. That means a lot to me. Not only have you written a book between now and the last time we talked to you, you've also <laughs> taken on some huge projects. So let's talk about the <laughs> Choose Strong project. And yeah. this is going to blow people's minds. So um, I'll just have it, have you explain what that is, first of all. What is the Choose Strong project? Yeah, it was um, five events over the course of, I think it came out to like 84 days it was. Um I might be wrong on that exact number. I, it's so crazy because it was less than a year ago. But we've done so much since the conclusion of the Choose Strong project that I'm like, how has it not even been a year? We have 81 so it, days, 81 days written down. Yeah, here 81 days. Okay, thank you. So over the course of 81 days, I, I chose very specific events that um, in some ways represented different seasons of my life, really like my my childhood. There is some over – if you read my book um, – so uh, most people followed along with the Choose Strong Project, but then if you leave, read my book, it makes way more sense. You're like, oh, dang. So, um, <laughs> But last year, I turned the age that my mom was when she died. So she was 43 when she passed away. I was 17. Um, and consequently, um, I have a 17-year-old daughter, 43 mm-hmm. years old. Um, so it was a really, really special time in my life. I have a, f- a 15-year-old son, too, and 15 was the age that I was when she was diagnosed with cancer. So having two kids at that are the same age that I was at the most critical kind of painful time in my life was, was mind boggling to me because I realized, and I've had this conversation with my kids over and over. I'm like, I didn't, I don't always know what I'm doing as a mom. <laughs> Cause I didn't have that. I didn't, I never got past this point in my life where I had like a healthy mom that was mm-hmm. right alongside me. And so, um, I wanted to celebrate that. I wanted to celebrate this idea that um, I had spent some years of my life fearing that I was going to die young like her, that I was going to be sick, Mm. my life would be shortened, um, that my my children would would have to watch their mom pass. I mean, it was a very, you know, very strong fear that I had, but then I chose to, I'm not going to live in that fear. I want to live as strong as I possibly can. I want to fill my life. Um, with the things that I love and that I'm passionate about. And, and so this Choose Strong project, um, I chose it specifically for 2022 because I would be turning 43 and I wanted to honor my mom and just the power um, that she was in my life and, and kind of tell her story, but also as a way to send a message to the community that um, I know is a professional, you know, I've been doing this professionally for 10 years now, and it's really easy to look at the lives that we scroll through on Instagram, in social media and those around us and to think, well, it must be nice for them Mm. because they have A, B, C, and D. And I don't, you know, I'm dealing with this. I'll never have that. Or they were just born this way. I wasn't, I'm not capable. Um, And I think, you know, I've been there so many times in my life, especially early in my life that I I thought I want to set up a project that isn't going to elevate my, um, my role as a professional athlete, but is rather going to tell a story that's hard. And, and I'm going to be able to relate to, um, people in a new way because the goal for these events was not to get on the podium or to race. The goal was just to get to the finish line. And so I knew that I needed to first choose like incredibly difficult courses. Um, and so the first one was Badwater 135, which that's how the project kicked off, which was insane. Cause it's like one of the toughest races in the world. I mean, that's the wow. tag of it. Toughest foot race on the planet. A couple weeks later, I did one of the toughest hundreds in the United States, which states, which is Andrews Crest 100, which has altitude, heat, and insane climbing. Mm. Um, and then like 17 days after that, I did Leadville 100, which um, both Andrews Crest 100 and Leadville 100 only have a 50% finishing rate um, because they have so much extremes within the race. So the first three events were, were within 35 days of each other, um, totaling 335 
um, miles. And I think it was like 78,000 feet of climbing within, within all of that. Um, I then a couple weeks after finishing Leadville flew to Switzerland. Um, that race I had actually been in, invited to, but I decided to make it a part of the project. Um, we did a, a race in the Swiss Alps. It was about 110 kilometers, um, about 25,000 feet of climbing. And then we came home and 11 days later, um, I became the first woman to double summit um, Mount Whitney from Lone Pine. So it's at the very, very bottom of the mountain. It's the little town that sits at the base of the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the tallest mountain in the lower 48 states. Um, it was a 92-mile trek, um, 22,000 feet of climbing, and of course, um, in extreme altitude. And then the, the last thing we did, which we did not showcase or chronicle because it was just really personal, was I ran from my childhood home where my mom passed away to her gravesite, but it just so happened to equal out the number of miles that I had set for myself for this project, which the number of miles represented the number of months that my mom lived. So it was 507 months that she lived and I ran 507 miles. So that project was, um, thankfully was chronicled and backed by Bear Performance Nutrition. They sent out two incredible um, filmmakers, Drew Darby and Tyler McCain. They became like family to us. They, you know, pretty much traveled around the world across country with us for four months chronic chronicling this journey. And then we had a world premiere release of it in Austin, Texas, ran out a little uh, theater out there, had a big event. We had shirts made um, and the release of the Choose Strong film, which you can see today on, on YouTube, um, kind of tells that story. So that's the that's the first like big, big project. And then we hit off the, the new year with uh, an announcement of 200. So it's been a whirlwind of like, t like nine, 10 months, I think. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I remember, um, I remember watching the film and during the Leadville trail 100, of course you have to run all night, you know, to yeah. make it. And it's like a 30 hour yeah. cutoff. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, you were pretty tired. And so you just wanted to lay down for 10 minutes Yeah, in a yeah. sleeping bag. It's cold. It's in Colorado at elevation. Yeah. And just watching that, I, I, I knew I would have never gotten out of that cot. Like, <laughs> like it looked so warm and cozy compared to what yeah. you were dealing with out on the trail. Oh, but and that was like a, a compounded, you know, I, I, at that point I had run 300 and, and like, 30 miles or 315 miles over the course of, you know, of, of 35 days. Like I, mm. I was not recovered. I mean, that was the goal. I was like, I won't, I'm purposely putting all these races close to each other because I know I won't re be recovered. I won't feel strong. I won't feel like sprightly and like fast and like I'm going to be at every start line with a new struggle. And that is the story that I'm going to, tell. And Leadville, I've known about it since the first time that I came into the ultra running scene, but the altitude for how long you're at extreme altitude kind of um, intimidated me because I have just some natural um, breathing problems. And so I knew that um, usually like once I go past like six, seven hours, I, I kind of, I exasperate a little bit. Um, and so I knew, okay, there'll, there'll be like some struggles. And, and that is really what it was. I mean, I, I had been stumbling and falling quite a bit and um, was really dizzy. I wasn't able to keep my uh, core temperature up. And, and so, um, you know, I remember following my, my buddy, Hella Sidibe, like following his voice. He wasn't very far in front of me as I came into that aid station because um, I just kept on falling down. And when I told Eddie, I was like, if I don't reset here, I'm not finishing this race. Like I wow. can't even tell like what direction I'm walking in anymore. I'm so like out of it, but I'd never experienced that, um, to that degree, like in a hundred mile race. I mean, that's like my, the distance that I love. And, um, so yeah, that was, that was really difficult, but that finish was one of my favorite finishes of the whole project because, um, there was a lot of overcoming, uh, that had to happen in order for me to to get to that finish line far outside of just being tired. <laughs> it's a whole new so. level. I mean, Leadville I've heard is just incredibly tough, even if you're going into it fresh as your goal race, you know, and then on the heels yeah. of two huge um, events that you, you really hadn't recovered from having to mm -hmm. face those new challenges that, mm -hmm. yeah. And when you're really having to just decide you're going to be strong when it's not coming naturally, I think no. that's really powerful. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I had, I had a pretty bad fall on the backside of, of, um, Hope's Pass again. That was just, I was just so dizzy and fell pretty hard. And, um, I laid on the ground for a minute and I just told myself if, if nothing's broken, like we're okay. But it was a pretty bloody wound. But I came into the aid station and Eddie's like, dang, dude, you want to clean that up? And I was like angry. I was like, no, it's a distraction. We're ignoring it. This is like, <laughs> there's nothing wrong. But um, yeah, it was pretty bruised for a couple of weeks after that. But I looked like I had just gone to war by the time I, I crossed the finish line. I, I was pretty beat up. I mean, you see that in, in the mm. film, but... It was not, not uh, glamorous at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. When you're, when you're coming in back into Leadville and you see the finish line, you know, you see that, that road and you, the finish line's in your sight and you're yeah. running, you're running it in and then just coincidentally, like no, no really any attention is given to this in the film, but like Courtney DeWalter's there gives you a hug and then you keep going. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I know who that was. <laughs> yeah, Courtney, and I'm bummed they didn't get Maggie because Maggie was actually running with me for a little bit. Mm. For like um 50 meters, she ran like next to me, like cheering me on, like, yeah, girl. <laughs> and um, yeah, Maggie and Courtney were were all good friends. And uh cool. Courtney was out at, at one of the aid stations. I gave her a big hug. I was like, What the heck are you doing here? And she lives so close to the finish line. You can mm. walk to her house from the finish line. And um, so yeah, that was that was super fun. There was a lot of awesome awesome spectators along the way. It's neat to see how the whole city comes out for that race and just cheers every person into the finish. It, it really is special. If, you know, I know not everyone listening is interested in hundreds. You don't have to be, but the opportunity to crew pace volunteer at these races is so inspiring. And, mm -hmm. you know, the ultra community is, is something really special. Yeah. How do you like running in the Alps? <laughs> Mm. You mentioned, you mentioned you had that ultra in Switzerland. Yeah. You know, in 2016, it was my goal to, um, start racing internationally. So from, and well, I actually started in 2015 and then 16, I was like, I'm, I'm, I was getting invited to races all over the world pretty regularly. And I was like, dude, this is like the best part of my career, man. Like yeah. I will go everywhere. And I remember my coaches <laughs> at the time were like, you're racing way too much. But I was like, but I want to go to South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. Like I, I wanted to go everywhere. So, um, and then, and then COVID hit, I think when COVID hit, I was supposed to go to like Portugal and Iceland and Italy and wow. race in the Dolomites. I mean, there was like all these races I had on my calendar. And, um, so the Alps will always be really precious to me. I'm especially, um, fond of the Italian Alps. So I've done UTMB five times. And the only reason why I've done that race so many times is just because I love those mountains. And every time I come home, I tell Eddie, like, how can we move there? Like, I know that one day I'm going to retire in the Italian Alps in the Aosta Valley. Like it's just so precious. I love the people and the food and it, it is just so amazing. And, um, yeah, so any chance that I, I have gotten to race over there, you know, I I've taken it, but once the world kind of opened up a little bit, I was like, you know, it's been like many years since I've just made my calendar, uh, my race calendar in the United States. And so that's what I've been doing the last two years is, um, picking more, more races in the United States. And that's been really fun. Just getting back into the community here, um, elevating the races that directors work so hard to, um, put out, you know, and, and not everyone gets the chance to race internationally. And so I think keeping my career full and balanced in, in that way, I, I really do want to, um, you know, be racing and, and like home, you know, that it's like, if you can't go and, and race out of the country, like there's so many great places right there in, in your backyard. So that's been super fun is exploring that. But yeah, I think at some point in my life, I'll probably find a way to, uh, spend my last days in, in the Alps. <laughs> okay. Sounds like a solid goal. I know what yeah. you mean. <clears throat> I was just yeah. in a, at a marathon in Belgium and talked to a guy who he's just a recreational runner, but he's probably in his seventies now. And he figured out how to do that. He, um, lived as an international teacher, worked as an international teacher and had, oh, has a house cool. still in Breckenridge, Colorado, but retired oh. and bought a house in Switzerland in the German speaking part down by Zermatt, oh, Switzerland. Gosh. And he's like, yeah, he says, I bought a house in Breckenridge in 78 
And then they built a ski gondola there and the house is now worth a couple million dollars. I'm like, yeah, oh, that's yeah. what you do. <laughs> easily. Yeah, easily. That guy is so stoked. He probably, does he just Airbnb it? For- <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. He had it figured oh, out. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so I've always, I've always wondered, so when you get invited to these races, do the races typically like pay all the expenses, like your flight yeah. and hotels and all that? Yeah, it's nice. everything. I, I, I learned early on, uh, 2015 was the first year that I did UTMB. And then I, I, from there, I just, I, I kept on, um, you know, just taking race invites. Racing internationally is different than it is in the United States. And certain countries too take it so seriously. Like you, you feel like, wow, like everyone here loves this sport and they, they (laughs) treat you, um, almost like royalty, you know, Mm. the way that they, um, provide for you and, um, all the stuff they have set up and accommodations that pick you up at the airport. I mean, it's like, it's a big deal. And then of course, all the media that surrounds it, um, you know, and, and, all the international races, it's like they have required gear and like everyone yep. that lines up is like kitted out, whether you're a professional or not. Like everyone is like just yeah. very f- serious. Whereas, you know, you go to a race here and it's like maybe guys are wearing shirts, maybe not. Like maybe like half of us have gear. Like most of us might have a water bottle. <laughs> like there's, like we're just like chill. Like we we finish the race, we grab a beer, we sit in our fold up chairs, we tell stories like and I love that. Like I love I really love that about American racing. Like it is what you want to make it choose your own adventure, like show up, like wear whatever the heck you want. Like, if you think you need that much gear, bring that much gear. If you don't, you don't need it. (laughs) And I think that's super cool. So, um, there was a learning curve for me to, um, when I first started racing internationally, cause I am more on the laid back side, um, to then where I was like, Oh, I better, (laughs) I better brush my hair before this interview, like, (laughs) you know, or maybe like not wear like my dirty, like baseball cap, like every single time I'm like getting a picture taken. Like it was just like a a kind of a, uh, getting used to the, the cultural norms of, of trail racing. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's evolved too. I mean, it's uh, one of the fastest growing sports in the world. And so that's been Mm. Really exciting. Um, you know, that there's some growing pains in that too. But I think overall, the, the sport is just such an incredible way to connect within the world on a on a in a real and a raw way outside of our screens. And so I'm just excited for the direction it's going. And I hope that that more people do it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you're not one to shy away from big challenges. You kind of teased a little bit that your project this year is taking it up to the 200 plus mile level. Um, So you just completed the Cocodona 250. um, And I was listening to your guys' recap on your podcast, which was really fascinating. For people who've never heard of it, kind of tell us where it's located. Like, what about the time limit? How you prepared logistically? I mean, it seems like overwhelming to even prepare for a hundred miler, you know, although that's pretty much your comfort zone. But for most people listening to this, they're going to think 250 miles, like what the heck? (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I'll tell you what, when the sport, when the distance was first released, um, it, not a lot of people knew about it. Not a lot of people were doing it. Um, around like 16, 17, people started nudging me like, dude, are you going to do the 200s now? And I was like, heck no, it's so far. Like how much running do you actually do? Like that just sounds, it's kind of sounds ridiculous. And, and I was having so much fun doing hundreds. Um, and there's so many hundred mile races that I, that I wanted to do. I thought I'll do 200s later, you know, or maybe Mm -hmm. never, but, um, this past year, I think doing the true strong project, it re it, it kind of ignited a, a curiosity about them because I I'd, I'd only ever gone 135 miles. The Choose Strong Project, um, I I was recovering like like my body felt way more amazing than I thought it would in between races. I wasn't recovered, but I I was amazed that I wasn't like hobbling or like I didn't get injured at all. Like it was it was like oh okay like I I think I can like actually go pretty far. And I've always been fascinated with like through hikers. So I, I have so much respect for, you know, people that are out on the trail for weeks at a time and, and how they carry those heavy packs and, um, and even maybe a little jealous that they could just be in the mountains for weeks on end, just with a, with a pack and a tent, you know, like yeah. so cool. So I think 200s, they, 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 
definitely mesh a through hiker and an ultra runner. Um, if you only through hike, like you can definitely do these 200s because most of them have such long cutoff times that hmm. you could get away with doing like 50, 55 miles a day, which might sound like a lot to through hiker, but you have to remember like there's aid stations, there's drop bags, you can have crew, you're not carrying a 40 pound pack. Um, you know, that much weight definitely slows you down. And so, um, yeah, you could, you could do 200s like fast hiking. And, mm. um, you know, it starts Monday morning. You have until Saturday at, at noon for Coca mm -hmm. Um, it was 125 hour cutoff. So, so yeah, the approach to it was really mysterious to me because, um, I thought, well, I'm not going to be naive and think that I can train for these things, uh, as a, like the same way I do for a hundred mile race. And I can't be naive and think that just because I've done hundreds my whole career that I'm even be good at these. <laughs> um, you see that in ultras, you see road marathoners that are fast and like, oh yeah, I'm going to smash this 50 miler. And they're literally walking at 30 miles, right? Like that's cool. Yeah. You can run at 240 on the road, but like, that doesn't mean that you can run through mountains and through streams, you know, it's like, there's, there's a learning curve to everything we do, whether it's pacing, getting used to the gear, getting used to the food, running at night, the changing weather and terrain. I mean, there's a lot to be respected. And I wanted to go into my first 200 with the mindset of a student. I'm going to learn everything that I can during the training. I'm going to learn in this race. Um, and I, I want to grow in this distance. I want to discover it because it was so mysterious to me. So I decided to sign up for four of them. And, um, I guess I, I, by doing that, I entered the grand slam series of 200. So oh, nice. it is Coconut 250, which, um, starts in Phoenix, Arizona, it's a point to point that ends in Flagstaff. So you're, you're running through places like Jerome and Sedona and Prescott. And um, you're running through desert, high altitude, um, through rivers, rocky sections, roads, neighborhoods. I mean, it's, it's one of the most beautiful adventures. I'd have to say hands down as of today, like my favorite race I've ever done. It was such wow. an amazing experience. Uh, the next one is Tahoe 200. It originally was June 16th, but there's so much snowpack around Lake Tahoe here in Northern California, uh, which also also edges in, in Nevada too. Um, but that one is now at the end of July. So July 21st, I'll be doing that. Um, the same race director puts on a uh, Bigfoot 200, which is usually then two and a half months after Tahoe 200, but now it's two weeks after Tahoe 200. Ooh. So yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. Bigfoot 200 apparently is one of the toughest ones in the 200 of races. Um, and that one is up in Washington. You're going to be going through like Mount St. Helens, a lot of rugged uh, areas that, that people don't typically hike. Um, I think there's even some private property in there, but it's supposed to be in so beautiful. I mean, the PNW in the summer is unreal. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And then uh, there's Moab 240 in October, and that is in the beautiful Red Rocks of, of Utah, um, which most people are familiar with that. I mean, it's pretty iconic to Utah. It's just mm -hmm. very unique terrain that you can only find in specific places on the planet. And um, yeah, so running 240 miles in that area is, is going to be pretty pretty awesome. So the goal is to do something different every race and just to learn to grow. You know, um, I think when I first started running ultras, there wasn't a lot out there with how to train for hundreds, a lot of really funny training plans and unconventional <laughs> ways. We're all trying to figure it out. That's where the 200s are right now too. Mm -hmm. There are so many variables that I don't even know if there'll ever be like a very specific way to train for it because food and sleep are involved, whether you want it to be or not. And we are all different in that. So for those of you listening that are interested in 200s, if you're one of those crazies that gets to do life on four and five hours and you're a rock star at that, which I just think is just a special gift uh, to have, <laughs> like 200s are your jam, dude. Like you will <laughs> you will crush these things. Um, but out, outside of that, it's uh, just learning to to keep going no matter what, because you that's a lot of ground to cover. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you drive 200 miles, you feel that. You're like, dude, when are we getting out of the car? Like, this is a long <laughs> car ride. So um, being on your feet for that long is, it's very different from 100. I, I You can't compare the two. Uh, we put a film out on it called uh, Every Step Forward. And that was one of the things I said in the opening was, these aren't ultras. These are epics. It's, it's beyond an ultra. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally an epic adventure. And, you know, if it's something that, 
that you think about doing, do, you know, it would be fun to do it with a friend. It would be fun to put on your bucket list at least once. They are expensive too. I'll be candid about that. Um, you know, I thankfully was in, invited by the race directors uh, to do these. And so I don't take that lightly because doing four of them is very expensive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're looking at like a $2,000 investment when all is said and done in order to do these races. So, but, it, you know, some people use it as their vacation. They'll take the whole family <laughs> out. There's some people that will stay in hotels along the way. Um, you just have to approach it like that because you're, you're asking your crew to take a week off. You're taking a week off of work or that's your vacation time you're using. So it is a unique event because of the money and time invested, but the experience is 100% worth it. Mm -hmm. Well, you really make, you're really talking it up well. <laughs> yeah. I think that's going to involve so many extremes, you know, mountains, deserts, rivers, yeah. hot, yeah. cold, <laughs> sleeplessness. Uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. Lots of good food. I ate so much food. I was eating pizza and lasagna. I mean, I was like eating stuff I never eat when I race. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah, you got to. Because you can't go for calories. just days and days on gels and, you know, the simple no. sugars. You've got to have more substantial yeah. stuff. So Salads. You, you have to kind of train your body to be able to Salad. tolerate <laughs> Go like for days on just salads. <laughs> just, yeah. Just broccoli. Broccoli, just a lot of fiber. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That'll digest well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like who's having the green diarrhea along the yeah. course? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely learn really quick what does work and doesn't work out there. <laughs> definitely stay away from the vegetables. <laughs> so it's would that be considered like a, a, a stage race? No. So I've okay. done a stage race before, and stage races are super fun. Uh, one of the most popular ones here in the United States is um, Trans Rockies. That's a legit stage race. Mm -hmm. You know, you you the company is setting up a campsite for you. Yeah. At the end of each day, okay. you hang out with your friends, you have a barbecue, there's a masseuse there, you're kicking up your feet. Um, that's what I want. You have these long yeah, recovery periods. <laughs> yeah. Those are super fun. I did one down um, in, in Chile and mm -hmm. oh my gosh, dude, I had the best time. And every day we ran a 50 K, it was like five days long. You run a 50 K each day, but it's like, yeah, you're like tired. Work for you. <laughs> you're like yeah, and and you, it definitely compounds over time. Cause we were running up volcanoes and through jungles. I mean, it was not easy terrain, yes. but you become best friends with everyone in the race. Like I still keep in touch with those people. And that was like back in 2017 when I did that. <laughs> um, still like one of the greatest experiences, like huge fan of stage races. Um, I've never done Trans Rockies. I was supposed to do it with Maggie actually in, in I think it was 2020. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the races that we weren't able to do. But um, I hear nothing but great things about that race. So yeah, stage races are different. You have structured sleep and a very structured specific section of the course that you do each day. Okay. So with the 200 mile races, it's up to you there. The Cocodona had nine sleep stations. You could sleep at every one if you wanted, or you could keep on going, but they're just inside the aid stations. So um, and you have to bring your own food at Cocodona or Moab 200. So that one, the aid stations are like, you know, if, if you've been to a 100 mile race like and you've seen the aid stations yeah it's like a buffet it's like it's like oh, cool. uh, even better at the 200s so in sedona mile 140 i think it was um i had like a bacon cheeseburger there was pancakes i mean i it was so much amazing food and then the huge um hall had like 50 cots in it. So if, you know, if you want it and it was like air conditioned and there was bathrooms, some places have showers, a mm -hmm. couple of eight station showers. So yeah, you don't need, I met a lot of people that were doing it entirely alone. Wow. No pacers, no crew. Mm -hmm. You, you definitely can do them alone. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so people who maybe follow you on social media may, might've seen some gnarly pictures of your feet <laughs> after this race. <laughs> And you said that you never had Sorry. problems with your feet before. I mean, I'm I'm a nurse, so They're gruesome so pictures bad. don't bother me. But you know, maybe a forewarning for people who are squeamish. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you said that that started about mile eight. Is that correct? Yeah. So we're I mean, talking about yeah. during your 250 miler. Yeah. So mile eight, yeah. you realized that something's not going right with your feet. Like, yeah. How did that play out for you? 
Yeah, you know, that was, uh, there There was two things that had to happen in that moment. The, the first thing was I had to take 100% responsibility for the problem that was happening or else my mind would have gone into a really negative mindset. I think it's really easy when things are going wrong to like want to blame the universe. Like, it's just not my day. Why does this always happen to me? Like, this sucks. And, and, and I've had my fair share of DNF. So I want to make that clear to everyone listening. Like, I've had my fair share of DNFs where I'm like, you know, it just wasn't the day I trained for. And it's like, then I'm like, dude, that sucks, man. <laughs> like, like, what if I like, okay, it wasn't the day I trained for, but maybe it was the day I was supposed to have. Because I think that in every setback, our failures, the challenges, you can learn so much. And I think in that moment when I realized what I had done, so I've, I've worn Belega socks for years. I had a good friend introduce them to me. They're a sock company out of South Africa. Um, I still am a big fan of them. I've, I, their socks last forever, like 10 years. Like you can wear these socks. It's like just the right amount of cushion. And so I had stocked up on socks and we had a whole mess of gear for like a month in my front room. So every time I would get gear, I would put it into its pile. Like this is like the clothes. These are the shoes. This is like headlamps. These are the batteries. Like this is nutrition. Like it w- it took up two different couches <laughs> and um, it was a mess. What had happened was my Belega socks came and I did not wash them. So I had had gear coming in throughout the week. Like Nike had sent me like our, the brand new kit that came out, which was that green thing that I was wearing um, mm-hmm. for most of the race. That was uh, part of our team kit. Um, and then like my Bear Performance Nutrition was sending me a bunch of nutrition. So what was going on in, in the thick of it was stuff was coming in. Eddie and I would undo the boxes and we'd throw stuff into their piles. Well, I did not wash my socks. And, and, these particular socks, they have, um, they're, they're colorful and they were very slippery. You have like the color dyes and I know it, this might not be for everyone, but like, I like to wash all my gear. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if you've ever bought stuff. It just feels different when you buy it. You feel like you, it either feels like it's just dirty because like it's other people have touched it or it's just the oils from whatever they use to dye it. Mm -hmm. And so after the race, I did a bunch of research on that too. And I came across a few through hikers that had talked about the um, detriments and the reasons why people get blisters and foot care and things you can do. And this one particular article talked about that the sometimes the um, chemicals in the dye on socks can irritate your skin. Well, this has never happened to me before. I wash everything. I tried everything in my training. I mean, I think I spent like six weeks at least wearing the same thing that I wore on race day Mm -hmm. in every long run. And so um, getting to the race, we got up like at three o'clock in the morning. I had a pile of socks, but they're all the same socks, all everything that I had tried. And those were the socks that I put on oh, the Belega socks that weren't washed. So it, the draw. It, it is. <laughs> yeah. And I know, um, and the shoes I was wearing, I was so confident. I mean, they're the same shoes I've worn for 10 years. So the wild horse is my shoe. Um, so I had actually two shoes that I trained in. I trained in the wild horse and the Zagama. Um, and so I was very confident in that. That wasn't a, a second guess, but when I was probably four miles in, I was like, man, like my feet are sliding in my shoe. Like what the heck? And I thought maybe it's the terrain, but the terrain out on Cocodona, um, wasn't new to me. It, it's very like here in Southern California, I, I train a lot in high desert. Um, I'm also three miles from death Valley. Like I'm very used to running in, in desert terrain. Um, I'm used to running in high mountains along the ocean, like, and I've raced all over the world. So for me, crossing rivers, getting my feet wet, um, isn't new to me. And I, I've never experienced any problems. Uh, you name the weather system or the, I mean, I've run in races where my feet are wet the entire race and, and my feet have been fine. So I think what happened was my feet started sliding, which then created more than a blister. Like the skin just started wearing away. And at mile eight, um, they show it in the film. You can kind of see me like moving around on this, like aid station cam. I wish that I still would have been in there, but in that aid station, I put blister packs, uh, blister covers like on my, the backs of my heels. And then I think I had one on my pinky toe at this time in the end, I ended up having 10, uh, 
feet wounds because oh, then they just weren't blisters anymore. Like when so, the skin is, is gone, it's like a wound. <laughs> yeah. Well, then it, then it became a problem because, um, you know, then you're running through like gravel and sand and there was some sections that was just all rocks. Cause I brought like Tiva sandals. Cause I knew I was like, just because I've never had blisters doesn't mean I won't get them. And regardless of, of my 10 years of, of racing, I always carry blister stuff with me. I mm-hmm. always do the prevention. I take really good care of my feet. And so I, I know what to do. So in this time, in this moment, like I had the lube. And so I put like the, the, what all like the, I think, I had squirrel's nut butter with me. Mm-hmm. And then I had the, um, the bandages, these special bandages that are blister specific. And I then told myself at mile eight, I'm not going to see Eddie until mile 37. And the next aid station is just a water stop. So I have 30 miles that I need to not focus on what's going on in my feet because I've done everything that I can to care for them. Mm-hmm. So even if I kept on stopping, like what, what doesn't, what I'm going to do, keep on putting bandages on them. There's already bandages on them. So I knew that I had to just kind of compartmentalize that in that moment. Whereas the other side of me was like, I'm going to now freak out, be so angry. I can't believe my race is beginning like this. I can't believe this happened. I trained so hard. I, you know, why is this happening to me? And I just had that conversation with myself. We're not going to do that. Like, and so uh, one of the things that I do, which I think is a great race strategy is I latched on to a group of people and I, I was passing people, but then I came across this girl that I was moving faster than her. And then I thought I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to climb with her. And I did for like 20 miles Mm -hmm. and she was so lovely and had, had such a great disposition. We got along really well and we moved really well together. And I just felt like that was kind of a saving grace because I just didn't focus on my feet anymore. I was like, I'm going to focus on getting to know this runner. And we had like such a great time. That was the only time I ran with a girl for the the rest of the race. Like (laughs) most of the runners that I was with were all guys, which was super fun too. Like I had such a great time. And then my, my pacers were, were girls, but like, I normally don't get to experience that in, in a race for such a long, you know, such a long section. So I think, running, um, with that idea of like, I'm, I'm just going to focus on getting to Eddie and I know I can take care of things there. But once I got to him, uh, we took off my shoes and socks and I thought, oh man, like this is, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in for it for, for the rest of the You've race. 200 so more miles of this. <laughs> yeah. <more>. Yeah. 213 <laughs> wow. more miles to go. <laughs> so I know there isn't like a one size fits all decision matrix, but do you have any tips on how to decide whether to continue a race or when to pull out, especially when you're mm-hmm. experiencing some kind of physical pain or discomfort. Mm-hmm. Because you've, you know, great, you've had a lot of different question. things that have come up through the years yeah. um, and have yeah. through them. For sure. I mean, my, my very first 100 back in 2012, um, halfway into the race, I realized, you know, I had a stress fracture in my leg. I thought it was shin splints. And then, um, we did a few little, there's a few little tests that you can do. Yeah. Little things. And I was like, oh crap. Um, and, and that was before I was, I was competitive or anything. I was just figuring out the sport. And I, you know, I look back a lot at at some of the decisions I've made over the years where I, I have pushed through some pretty significant pain to get to the finish line. I mean, I finished that race too in in fourth place, but the next day I was in crutches. Mm -hmm. Um, would I do that over again? I don't know. Like probably, I probably would. <laughs> and, and I, I'd say to, um, to my listeners, I think the, the first and foremost is understanding that like pain is like, it feels so different for all of us. And a, one of the reasons why is because of like our foundation and our starting point. So for me, I, I've grown up as a lifelong athlete. And, um, and you know, you'll, you'll read in my book too, that like, I grew up in a certain setting where, um, I absorb physical pain just differently. It's, it's something about me that that's how it will always be for the rest of my life. Um, I realized that in different situations, um, like when I was having my kids, I had emergency C-sections with both my kids, but the doctor's 
because of my pain tolerance, the doctors were always like, how did you not feel this? Or like, how you, you didn't know you were in transitional labor. Like you almost lost your daughter. Like, but for me, I just go into like a different place in, in extreme pain sometimes. And so I think that what I've come to learn is like, you can't judge someone for DNFing in a race because that one blister hurt so bad or like their ankle hurt or their knee hurt or their IT bands or whatever. You you have to get to a point in your racing where th- what you are doing has nothing to do with what other people think of you. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with your value. Um, you are not better or worse if you finish the race. Yeah. That if you finish a race, it, it should be for a reason that is meaningful to you and you alone. You will always have your critics and you always have people that give you um, compliments and flattery and, and be in awe of you. But like if you do those things, either for the compliments or, you know, like that's going to be empty, too. And I think that that is what's helped me in races is this. I'm doing this not for any type of increase in value or to prove anything to anyone. It's because it it means so much to me. Mm -hmm. And, or it's because like in this moment in Cocodona, um, I was discovering something about myself that I didn't know I was capable of doing. I'd never had my feet like this before ever Mm -hmm. in my life. Like when people have talked about blisters, I mean, I've really had a handful of them. Um, I think in the Choose Strong project, I may have had one or two in there. I was like, oh, dang. But it was like for a short period of time, you know, and it wasn't like a big focus. But but my feet were so bad and they got continually worse as time went on that I realized that what I was doing was I was slowing down, but I was still moving. And I kept asking myself that like, wow, like I I actually am still able to move. And I would say to people listening, you also have to remember that that um, your love for the sport and what it is you're doing, can you continue beyond this in this injury? And that was always yes for me. Mm-hmm. If my bone was sticking out of my skin, would that be like, would I want to keep doing it? No. Like, what, why, why, why would I do that? You right. know, like it's just going to be way worse and maybe a permanent damage. I love running and what I do too much. If I had rhabdo or my organs were failing, like I would have not continued. And mm-hmm. I think that that is what is, you know, in, important for us personally is you weigh those things for yourself and um, you don't compare yourself to others. And I think that what was hard for, for you when you were 10, whether it's in discomfort, you know, whether you're, you're lifting weights, that five pound dumbbell was really hard to lift, but now you're up to a 15 pound dumbbell. Pain is the same way. You, when you endure a little bit of discomfort, you realize, okay, I'm a little bit stronger than that. Okay. That's my starting point now. Okay. I'm going to endure a little more, but we build on that over the years and we build on that in our experiences. So I think that instead of questioning, you know, why people feel the pain that they're in, ask with graciousness, where is that person in their journey Mm -hmm. and show compassion for that or see it as like, wow, I can get to that too. And I think in the film, that was one of the biggest messages we wanted to get across is it wasn't this extraordinary thing that I did. This is what humans are capable of doing. I don't have special body parts. I'm not, you know, (laughs) I still feel it all. Like I cried out there. Like I was exhausted. Like I had moments where I asked myself, how on earth am I going to even take another step? And, Mm. um, but being able to get to the finish line, that celebration was, oh my gosh, look what we can do. This is freaking amazing. Like this (laughs) is like humans are so capable of overcoming again and again and again, because it was more than overcoming physical limitations on the Cocodona course. It was a lot of mental demons and darkness and lows. And um, there was a lot of overcoming that had to happen. And I think it's it's exciting to relate that to life. It's exciting to insert that into my everyday life because life is much harder than a race and um we don't get to dnf out of our life but we can always Mm -hmm. dnf out of a race and Mm -hmm. come back to that and so yeah i think for people listening um this is definitely just a a very gracious message to you that you embrace the starting point of where you are at uniquely and be proud of it you know Mm -hmm. 
and um, and know that you you always come back. You always come back. You always try again. You always keep going. And what I can endure today is definitely not what I was able to endure 10 years ago. Yeah. So it's, I think that's the exciting part is we, we keep growing, we keep getting stronger. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. How long did it take for your feet to heal up after all that? There's a, a scene in the, uh, the film where they're trying to just slowly peel your socks off, uh, without taking too much skin with, <laughs> with the sock. I'm like, Oh, this is, this is not good. <laughs> It's funny because <clears throat> in that scene, I know, um, so Drew and Tyler, I mean, I love these boys so much. They're like our family. Um, and before, before we got back to the hotel, that's literally like 30 minutes after crossing the finish line. Wow. Before okay. we got back, Drew is like, Sally, you know, we have to get the feet. I was like, oh, I know, I know. I know we're getting the feet. <laughs> and I was like, are you guys okay with seeing my feet? <laughs> Exactly. You're not going to like feet pass are out just here. weird for people. Yeah. Like oh, some I people see. are like, I don't want to, I don't even like seeing people's feet in sandals. Like I don't, you know, like <laughs> you get like, and then you get people that love feet a little bit too much. And you're like, <laughs> so is it true? Like he was teasing me. He's, he's like, yeah. He's like, feet are just weird. Like, especially when you put on the internet, it's just weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. But so we they're, like good, they're good filmmakers. They're, they're yeah. interested in getting the shot, the money <laughs> shot. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they very specifically did not get my whole feet. So mm-hmm. you do not see the worst of it. You get the idea of it um, in the description notes of the film. I put a link. If you want to see it, here it is. Like mm-hmm. if, you, if you really want to understand what I was running on, I'm sorry in advance, but here's the picture. So um, yeah, that that was a very real raw emotion. And, um, and Eddie is, is just so gentle and had so much compassion for me in that whole race. It was really hard for him to see me mm-hmm. like that. Cause he normally doesn't ever see me like that. Like he was kind of shocked at just what was going on. So, yeah. um, taking off the, sh- the shoes and socks was not fun for any of us. I mean, Tyler and Drew too, were just like, Oh my gosh, dude. Like it was, it was a little nauseating. And I, it was so bad that I couldn't even tend to them completely. Like I had to, I had, I put them up on some pillows. Uh, Socks were still kind of hanging off of them and I fell asleep for a few hours. And then I got up and I had to soak them in a, in a tub for a while. And we had to use scissors to cut off the sock pieces Mm -hmm. um, and then soak them some more and then kind of slowly peel out, peel away everything from the feet. So um, it was, yeah, it was gnarly. I, I think. Do you have any uh, baby skin on your feet? <laughs> yeah. Your calluses there was, are all gone. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, there, there was the whole, yeah, we had one and two layers missing. The mm. back of my heel, uh, the right heel was the worst. It actually turned into an ulcer. I think mm. it was like a grade two or three ulcer amazing doctors and nurses online that reached out to me that said, you need to order this, order Mm -hmm. this, order this. This is how you care for them. Um, So I was super grateful for that because in my mind, I was like, oh, it'll just heal like the way that you think about a blister. But then I was like Mm -hmm. looking at my feet. I'm like, none of these are blisters. Like there was a couple like little ones, like, but the 10 wounds that I had on my feet, I mean, it was, they were bleeding and they were open and there was, um, so it took, three and a half weeks of three times a day cleaning them. Um, I had, I couldn't believe how much I had to spend on bandages because you Mm -hmm. had to change constantly changing all these bandages. Um, and then I, uh, officiated Billy Yang and and Hillary Yang's wedding. So I had, I mean, I had to, I didn't want, and it was like all the ultra community, right? Like, (laughs) And I was like, okay, I want, this is their special day. This is a few weeks after Coca-Cola. And I was like, I do not want people asking about my feet. Like, I just didn't want to take away, but I was like at the front of the, of everyone. So I was like, I have to get in heels because all I've been wearing was like, um, sliders and like Crocs. And yeah. I would put, um, leg warmers over my feet just lightly over my feet because they were covered in bandages. Mm -hmm. So I figured out a way to use hydro seals and I did some work and I was able to put on heels for like an hour 
and just kind of smile in my dress and everything. And then as soon as the lights went down and the music went on, I went put on some some hefty socks and was able to do it. But Dance um, in your Crocs. <laughs> yeah, it took three weeks before I could put on running shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, the race ended for me on Wednesday night or Thursday morning. I I can't remember. It was like three and a half days. But um, that Monday, I was back in the gym. I just mm-hmm. wore weird shoes and I was doing a lot of stair climbing, a lot of, uh, weight training. Um, but if you look at my feet right now, they, they don't look pretty. They are healed. And then I only have to wear one bandage now. So now it's, it's been a solid month since the race, but, um, I'm back, uh, you know, since last week, you know, logging miles and back in the mountains training. Nice. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) Thank you. Wow. (laughs) So, so they, you, you chose not to put the full shot of the feet into the film just, just because you don't want to change the, uh, the rating of the film or whatever. We didn't want YouTube to take it down. (laughs) (laughs) We we thought that, um, that actually was a real discussion too. Uh, yeah, definitely. It was so graphic Mm -hmm. and we, the feedback even now, cause I told you, I was like, well, don't you want to put it in the credits? Like you should show in the credits, like what my feet look like. He's like, honestly, Sally, like, I don't know. I think it's a little bit too graphic Mm -hmm. and the feedback that we have been getting is like, some people can't even handle that opening scene. Um, people say that they are like cringing, they cringe a lot and they're just like, that was too much. Or like, wow, you can feel the pain or, oh my gosh. So I'm like, okay, I guess it was a good balance of you, you see some of it, but you don't, you don't see all of it. And if you do click the link Mm -hmm. (laughs) if you want to see it in all its glory. (laughs) Angie's going to go and immediately click the link. Yeah. I saw the pictures on Instagram already, and I think you had there was like a sensitivity warning on them that you had to click past. So yes, yeah, there yeah, that one's pretty. Wow, bad. man. Uh, well, it's been an honor to talk to you, Sally. Congrats on the new yeah. book and Thank the you. films and all the um, the five hundred seven project and all the epic things that you've been doing. So, Thank you. if people want to go and find out more about you and order the book, where, where are some yeah. good places to send them? Yeah. I mean, you can always go to my Instagram. That's probably where I'm the most active. I'm yellow runner type in my name or yellow runner. Mm -hmm. There is a a single link. It's a link tree and you can get to my YouTube. You can get to my book. You can get to my strength app, my podcast. um, And then of course the film. Um, I think both films are up there, the choose strong Mm -hmm. project film. And then the every step forward film is in there. And um, yeah, it's the best way to, to keep up with me. And then of course, sallymccray.com. All right. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and good luck as you ease back into training for your next adventure. <laughs> yeah. We'll definitely couple be following you. A couple more 200 yeah. milers. Couple yeah. Three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Three more. So I'm, I'm excited. <laughs>